Today on Deconstructing CDK Patterns, we are discussing the Saga Step Function Pattern. Now, Sagas are not new. They've been around since 1987, but that means there's lots of great resources available. So they all still apply. This is just a serverless implementation of that pattern. We're also going to use some of the strategies found from Alex Debris' awesome book on DynamoDB to put three separate entities into a single DynamoDB table. So stay tuned to find out more. The first question we need to answer is what actually is a saga? So Hector Garcia Molina in 1987 wrote, long live transactions hold on to database resources for relatively long periods of time, significantly delaying the termination of shorter and more common transactions. To alleviate these problems, we propose the notion of a saga. A long-lived transaction is a saga if it can be written as a sequence of transactions that can be interleaved with other transactions. The database management system guarantees that either all the transactions in a saga are successfully completed or compensating transactions are run to amend a partial execution. So you can think about this in the tr traditional sense of normally if you have a transaction that requires four or five steps, you would put a lock on the database, run those four or five steps, if it succeeds, you release the lock. If it fails, you undo whatever you've done and then release the lock. But this takes time, reduces concurrency and slows down the whole system. Whereas a saga is about not locking the database. You just do all the records one at a time and some external process guarantees they all succeed or they all fail. Putting this together then into a real example, let's say you're booking a family holiday or a vacation depending on which side of the Atlantic you're from, you're going to want to book a couple of things. First one, you're going to need a hotel room and then you're going to need flights to get you there. You're also going to have to pay for these two things and typically you would go to some kind of website that lets you do all of this in one flow. Those three things together would be a saga or a transaction. This is what that flow might look like in the booking system. You can see on the left that our holiday booking saga starts with reserving the hotel, then it reserves the flights, takes your payment, and then confirms the bookings, followed by notifying the customer that everything has been booked. So that's, I would say that would be a pretty typical flow. But what about errors? Well, it's lucky Sir Isaac Newton's third law of sagas dictates that every action must have an equal but opposite reaction. Uh, so basically, if something goes wrong in a saga, you have two choices. You can either keep trying to go forward and fix the error, or you have to start failing backwards. Now, this is what the saga would look like if we introduce this error handling logic. So we move from the model we had on the left, which is happy path, to the model on the right, which has extra steps. And the green boxes pretty much line up exactly with the boxes on the left. The only difference is that confirm bookings has been split out into confirm hotel booking and confirm flight with notify customer split out into we have made your booking and sorry we couldn't make the booking. But let's just imagine something goes wrong in that take payment step. What happens with a saga is take payment will then trigger the refund payment task which then triggers cancel flight reservation and triggers cancel hotel reservation followed by notifying you that it didn't work. And this is how sagas function. Now it's important to note that all of these tasks have to be item potent. So you might be saying if there was an error with take payment, why are we calling the refund payment task? Well, that task should not issue a payment if we didn't take one in the first place. And if you call it three times, it should just only issue the re refund once. So that's a very important concept with this. And you'll notice that the errors are rolled back in layers so that this can be done in multiple slices instead of having to lock the database. Now to talk through what that really means in our Saga step function on cdkpatterns.com, we're just gonna step through a couple of the pieces of the architecture in detail before we go to the demo. So first up, DynamoDB. This uses a single table design for our Dynamo and that was inspired by Alex Debris' awesome book. Uh, he explains a lot of the concepts that you need to be able to build single table systems. So if you haven't read it, I would advise you do. We have one booking DynamoDB table then for this whole setup, but inside that one table, there are three separate entities, one for hotels, 
one for flights and one for the payment. The hotel model looks like this. You can see that the first thing we have PK and SK at the start. That stands for partition key and sort key. And that's because we have multiple entities in this same table. So it doesn't really make sense to give those a specific name. And you'll see why once we go into the other models. After that, we have trip ID, which is just a generic ID given to this whole booking. Next, we have a type, which is hotel, followed by the hotel booking ID, the name of the hotel, when we're checking in, when we're checking out, and then a transaction status for that two stage commit for saying, okay, we've reserved it, and then we've actually confirmed it. But it's best to show this with a second model in play. So the flights model, you'll notice looks very similar. We still have PK and SK at the start. We still have type, we still have trip ID, and we still have ID and transaction status. So PK completely identical, which means that if you did a DynamoDB query on this trip, you would be getting back flight information and hotel information. And that's why our sort key is overloaded. So this allows you to specifically filter on just hotels or flights in your query. The reason why the word hotel and the word flight is in there is because if you think about it, we are using potentially two completely different booking systems here. Like one is a travel operator for flights and one is a hotel. They could both use ID one for their booking. So if you didn't separate it by the hotel or the flight denominator, you could get a collision there. It's a very important concept. Next thing, we have trip ID, and even though that's our partition key, it's still good to call it out separately. It makes it a lot easier for like a global secondary index. The type field is just really used to make it easier to see the difference in the records. And then ID is the same field, so it doesn't get renamed between these two different entities, but the value being used is the specific ID from the hotel or the flight. And then finally, transaction status, it's the same pending. Payment transactions, very similar. Uh, the sort key is overloaded with payment. The type is payment. And then transaction status for this one's just confirmed because there's no two-step commit for this. It's just it either worked or it didn't. So after we have successfully made our booking, this is a small snippet of what the data will look like inside DynamoDB. There's a lot more columns as you saw in the previous data models, but I just wanted to show this very quickly. So PK is our partition key. You can see it's the same for all three records. Our sort key has flight, hotel, and payment at the start for the three different things, followed by the ID afterwards matches the ID in the next column. Then we have transaction status confirmed for all three the trip ID, which matches our PK in this instance, and then type as a separate column at the end showing flight, hotel, and payment. So three separate entities, one table. After you have deployed this pattern, you will have an API gateway, which will allow you to control the functionality and what parts of it fail. So you can see that there is a run type parameter that you can pass in, and that lets you fail the step function at either reserve hotel fees, confirm hotel fees, reserve flight fees, confirm flight fees, or during taking the payment. So that allows you to see how the saga will layer and then strip back all of the different errors at every phase. Next, what you can do is pass in your own trip ID if you want. And the reason why you might want to do this is because if you do not pass one in, it's hard coded to be the same ID on every call. So that means that by default, DynamoDB will overwrite the same records because we're using it as our partition key. So if you want to see multiple trips in the same database that has multiple entities, just pass in a couple of different trip IDs and you should be good to go. After our API gateway, we then have our Lambda, which is what invokes our step function. A concept I just wanted to talk to before we get into the step function is how it is invoked and what is passed in. This input JSON on the left is what gets passed into the step function when it's started. And it contains a bunch of data, some of it hard coded, some of it taken from the query params. 
The important concept with step functions is that this object can be modified at each step and then passed on for future steps. So this is the state, the representative state of the step function. You can see trip ID is what we just discussed taken from the query params. And then our trip is going from London to Dublin, staying in the Holiday Inn in July 2021. And there's some rental information about a Volvo which we don't actually use. Now, the next important thing about this state is that we have all these cancel tasks and these confirm tasks, and all of these are separate lambdas. So the way that the cancel and the confirm tasks are able to update Dynamo is that after the reserve tasks run, they modify that state I just talked about and add these result objects onto the global state. So you can see reserve hotel result and reserve flight result with the booking ID for the hotel and the flight. That is what we're able to use in the confirm and cancel tasks to be able to say, okay, let's either mark this transaction as confirmed or let's delete the record. Finally, all of the cancel steps have random failing logic inside them. You can see this if statement on the screen here with math.random. So basically the reason why this is done is if you remember, the purpose of a saga is that either the whole transaction succeeds or the whole transaction rolls back. Now, it wouldn't be very good if we hit some kind of error in our booking flow and then we hit some kind of error in our cancel task and the system is in an unrecoverable state. That is why the cancel tasks all have a retry policy of three times. So they'll hit this random error and then they'll have another go at least twice. The important thing to note though, is that in this setup, it is still possible for this math.random to trigger three times in a row and our step function to fail. So if you're building a saga, this is something you really want to think about. How do I handle failures in my cancel steps? Before we jump over to Cloud9, let's just talk about how you can get access to the code. So if you want the TypeScript CDK implementation of this, from a command line or terminal, just run mpx cdkp init the dash saga dash step function. If you want the Python CDK implementation, it's the same command, but just pass dash dash lang equals Python on the end. Finally, if you just want to view the code, you can always go to cdkpatterns.com or github.com slash cdkpatterns slash serverless. Now that we have talked through all of the theory and some of the details of the pattern, let's jump over to Cloud9, clone the code, deploy it, and do a demo. First up, let's clone the code. So we run mpx cdkp init the dash saga dash step function. And remember, if you want the Python version, just add dash dash lang equals Python on the end. Now that that has cloned, we can just cd into the folder. Um, with all CDK patterns, they all follow the same contract. So we can do npm run test, and this will run our suite of unit tests. There we go, 14 passed. And now we can just do npm run deploy, and that will kick off a deployment. Now let's talk through the actual CDK code base itself. So this pattern has nine Lambda functions included inside it. We'll walk through them as we're going down the CDK stack itself. So inside lib, the saga step function single table stack.ts, this is where we are going to focus most of our time. First up, we have our Dynamo DB table. And the important thing to note here is that even though we have three different entities defined in this table, we are not defining the schemas here whenever we create the table. All we define is the partition key and the sort key. This is one of Alex's main points from his book in that schemas do exist with Dynamo. They just live inside your code and we'll see that inside the Lambda when we get to it later. Now we have eight Lambda functions. Each of these represent the different steps in our step function. The CDK code for creating these was identical. 
So I made a helper function down at the bottom of the file called create lambda. And all this does is creates a lambda function that is node 12, takes the code from the lambdas folder and then passes in table name as an environment variable based on the DynamoDB table that we pass in as a parameter. And then we grant permission, grant read write permission to this function. So rather than having this exact same logic eight times, given we're in TypeScript, it just sort of made sense to make a wee helper function. Okay, so back to our eight functions themselves. I mean, the first one, reserve flight, is in flights slash reserve flight dot handler. So if I go lambdas flights reserve flight dot handler, and this first thing to note creates a flight booking ID. Now I do not have a flight booking system at hand to generate real IDs, but it is important that these tasks are item potent. So if you called the same handler with the same details twice, you should get the same ID. And I didn't want to just reuse trip ID. I wanted to show the different IDs everywhere. So that's why I create a hash code of trip ID and the departure airport and the arrival airport. So hopefully if you are on the same trip going between the same two airports, you should get the same ID. Then this is where our Dynamo schema lives. This is where we're doing our object creation or insert. So that is essentially where our schema is defined. And I've already walked through this in the theory section, so I'm not going to labor it. Just note that we can do DynamoDB put item dot promise. The next lambda is confirm flight. And confirm flight remember has to know the booking ID in order to be able to do anything. So the event is passed in. Every async function gets the event as normal. So booking ID is event.reserve flight result that I've mentioned a few times. So we can just go event.reserve flight result dot booking ID. And then we're doing a dynamo dot update item. And we're passing in our partition key as the trip ID which we got off the event. And then our sort key is flight hash booking ID and booking ID. Remember we got off this. So then our up, we're just updating with an expression to say it's booked. Cancel flight Lambda then is in flights cancel flight dot handler. So this one again, gets that booking ID from the same place. And this time we are doing dynamodb.delete item and we're just using the same partition key and the same sort key. You'll notice a trend with this. Reserve hotel lambda is hotel slash reserve hotel. And this is the format that I talked about in the theory. This is our Dynamo schema for the hotel object. And you can see this is just a DynamoDB put item like the flight one. And I actually didn't mention earlier, but this return is what gets put on the state for the step function. And we'll see that later because right now this is just a Lambda but whenever it gets added into the step function, I'll show you how this comes into it. Confirm hotel lambda. I mean, this is exactly the same. It's an update expression of confirmed. It gets the booking ID of reserve hotel result, which is the same as reserve flight result, only one more difference. and then cancel, it's exactly the same. So it's just a DynamoDB delete. Payment doesn't have the two steps sort of reserve it and then confirm it. We take payments and we refund payments. So these are simpler. 
So take payment.ts. I mean, it needs to have, make sure that there's a flight booking ID and a hotel booking ID because the payment ID is done as a hash code of those. And then this is our schema for payments. I just have $450 hard coded in for the cost because it doesn't really matter for this system. And then this one just does a put item. And then refund payment is in payment, refund payment that handler. And all this does is deletes the item. So there's no, there's no fancy logic in this to do with payments. It's just an insert and a delete. Okay, now for the actual step function. This is how we define our success and our failure states. So this is how we say you've either made the booking or we couldn't do it. These steps are called out like this because this is how you chain error flows together. If we only had the happy path, I can show you in a couple of seconds how that would look. In fact, we'll just do it now. So if we only had happy path, the way it looks is this. So we just chain together our step function definitions to go reserve the hotel, reserve the flight, take the payment, confirm the hotel booking, confirm the flight, and then say booking is succeeded. But this chaining doesn't have a nice fluid API to do all that error logic. So going back up here, this is organized to try and make it the same flow as the step function so that you can visualize it a bit easier. So step one, reserve the flights in the hotel. You can see this is reserve and cancel hotel. This is reserve and cancel flight. Step two, take payment is take payment, refund payment. And then step three is confirm flight and hotel booking. So it goes in the three sort of stages off the step function. Um, I know I'm jumping up and down a bit, sorry. Um, but reserve hotel to start here. First important point is we've used reserve hotel result in our other lambdas. So you can see this is how it's defined. The task itself is an invoke lambda function reserve hotel lambda and we're saying whatever comes out of that goes into the reserve hotel result object on the main state. So that is how that gets put there for us to use later. Then add catch works like any standard catch. It's in any error that occurs. I want you to go to this cancel hotel reservation task which is defined above it and then it just triggers the cancel hotel lambda. And it doesn't have a catch on it, it just has a retry and says if any error happens, try a maximum of three times and then the next task after this is booking field. Reserve flight then, it's similar in that the result path goes to reserve flight result and it goes to the reserve flight lambda and the catch for this goes to the cancel flight reservation which like before has a retry of max attempts three the difference here is this one doesn't go to booking field. This one goes to cancel hotel. So you can see reserve flight, if it has an error, goes to cancel flight. And cancel flight after that goes to cancel hotel, which goes to booking field. Then we have our payment. So take payment invokes the take payment lambda and it puts in take payment result. We don't actually use this for anything in this flow, but it's there. And if there's an error, it goes to refund payment, refund payment, three retry attempts. If after that, we go to cancel flight, cancel flight, after that goes to cancel hotel, cancel hotel, after that goes to booking field. Finally, in our confirm hotel booking tasks, uh, it goes to the confirm hotel lambda Again, it goes to confirm hotel booking result. We don't use it, but it's there. And then a catch goes to refund payment, which will not walk the flow again. And confirm flight, add catch, refund payment, confirm flight lambda, confirm flight result. So that's how it all chains together. I know you have to visualize a lot in your head, but when you see the step function images we've seen earlier, you can see the code directly relates to that. And then this is how we define a state machine where we pass in that happy path flow and give it a five minute timeout. 
This is our Saga Lambda that kicks off the step function. And it is down here, samdalaga.sagalambda.ts. And it just gets passed in the state machine ARN. And we give it permissions to start it. So as you can see, this has a hard coded run type and trip ID. But if you pass in the query string parameters of run type or trip ID, we use that instead. And then it simply creates this input object with, we're going from London to Dublin, staying the hot in in July, 2021. And it just creates a params object with that JSON as input as a string and does step functions, does start execution. If there's an error, we'll get back a status code of 500 with the message of there was an error. If everything goes okay, we get 200 status code with the holiday booking system is processing your order. So this is what you'll see if I click this deployed URL. Ta-da, holiday booking system is processing your order. Lastly, what you just saw is we have an API gateway that is using a proxy endpoint and any URL you hit is gonna to go to that Saga Lambda which kicks off the step function. Now, that is all of the CDK walkthrough. And since I triggered that, we can go to DynamoDB and there you go, we have a table. If I open that table, we have three items. All of them are status confirmed because our step function has completed. You can see flight hotel payment. Now something to notice is you will have empty cells and that is because that particular field doesn't apply to that object type. So payment amount only applies to payment, whereas hotel has check in and check out, and flights have arrival and depart at. So it's, it's very interesting the way this is set up, but we have three different records in the same DB. And if I go to the step function, We can see I have my booking saga. You can just click into it and see we had one execution. It succeeded. And then it will give you this nice logical flow as well as if you scroll down, it gives you all of the execution events and you can jump in and you can see all of the outputs that came out of all of the lambdas. So I'll just kick off a failure event just to show you what that looks like. So if I go back to that URL and do run type, we'll, we'll fail it at payment. So fail payment, booking systems processing our order. Go back to our thing. We've got a second one running. Oh dear, it failed at take payment. Refund payment, cancel flight reservation. Let's just refresh it and see. There we go. So that has executed. I'm just looking to see if any of those tasks failed. So cancel hotel reservation. There you go, that one failed. That was our random failure. As you can see, that's why it took slightly longer. So if I go to Dynamo now, and I refresh this. So I actually wanted to show you this because this is a flaw in the current setup. And this is to do with reusing IDs and being a training pattern. If you think about our flow, let me try and get the picture of the flow back for you. Actually, you can just get from here. So we go to reserve hotel, reserve flight, take payment and then we trigger through these. The way we know how to undo what was done is through the IDs that are put on the global state object. And remember, we're reusing trip IDs. So in this particular database, I had run a successful booking with that ID, with this ID. So I'd went through and booked, we had our hotel, we had our flight and we had our payment. Then I triggered this step function, which reserved a hotel, reserved a flight, but failed in the take payment step. But because we didn't generate our hash 
or take a payment. This refund payment step actually doesn't delete the record from Dynamo. And that's because it didn't insert it in this particular run through. It was inserted from a previous run. So it skips over it and then we undo the flight and the hotel reservation. So in a real system, you wouldn't let a second booking come in with the same booking ID. It's just, it's a, it's a quirk of a learning pattern to know. Um, to prove it's not a, if I delete that row and then I rerun this, what we'll get is See, nothing is in Dynamo. It's went through and it's cleaned up everything that it inserted. So it's just something to be aware of. So outside of that, I think that that is pretty much this demoed working. I've showed it working in a full success flow and I've showed it working in a cleanup flow. The only thing really to make sure that everyone is aware of again is clean up your accounts after you're done. So you can always run npm run cdk destroy. And that will use whatever version of cdk is in the project. And this will delete the resources from the account. And always remember to manually delete the DynamoDB tables because CDK will not delete those by default. It'll say skipped. All right. Hopefully you have learned something from this. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, come follow me on Twitter at CDK Patterns. Subscribe here on YouTube and hopefully see you again. All right. Thanks, everybody.